Hello and welcome to Huts of the Huskies fourth dog science explained video. This one will be discussing the scientific evidence around the effectiveness and welfare impact and the safety of electronic training collars, otherwise known as shock collars or e-collars, that administer an electric impulse or shock to the dog's skin. So advocates of electronic training collars argue they are a great method of training dogs at a distance to interrupt and eliminate self-rewarding behaviours, including dangerous behaviours such as sheep chasing or car chasing. And many sellers of e-collars also point out that the shock doesn't really hurt the dog, it's just a little pop-pop like the static from a car door, which interrupts the behaviour. Those opposed to e-collars claim that not only is the impulse painful to the dog, they carry risks such as the dog becoming fearful of the training area or the trainer themselves and can lead to aggressive behaviours towards dogs or people that are present at the time of the shock. And they also point out that if the impulse only acts as a little tap tap to interrupt behaviour, couldn't a voice command be used instead? So let's have a look at the evidence. We'll start with a study that concluded e-collars were both effective and had no negative behavioural consequences. The researchers used e-collars on 114 hunting breed dogs to train them not to chase sheep. So the dogs received an electric impulse if they were less than 1 to 2 metres from a sheep. The reactions of the dogs were tested walking towards a sheep while on a lead and then turned loose fenced in with a sheep in a field. And they tested the dogs at the start of the training and then again one year later. And the owners were also given a questionnaire to see if there had been any behavioural changes. So, when walked towards the sheep on the lead, two-thirds of the dogs showed interest in the sheep in the first year, whereas none of them did in the second year following e-collar training. And when turned loose in a field with sheep, none of the dogs attacked straight away, while half did in the first year before the e-collar had been used. Also, dogs received fewer impulses in the second year, so the number of times they were one to two metres close to the sheep decreased in the second year. And the owners reported no negative impacts on the dog's behaviour. And overall, the authors concluded that shock was an effective method to reduce sheep chasing behaviour. However, if you actually look at the results of this study, as in the data of it, you find that one-fourth of the dogs in the study still attacked sheep in the second year, and 12 still went one to two metres close, requiring shocks to prevent attack. And some dogs that didn't require an impulse in the first year did in the second year. And this study has also been criticised because only 42.1% of the dogs actually had any sheep chasing problems in the first year. And although this had dropped to 11.4% in the second year, that's only a decrease of 30.7%. So to put this into context, that's like you going to a dog training class of 10 people and being told that seven of you would find it completely useless. However, it could always be argued that this was due to lack of a structured training program throughout the intervening years. Uh, and finally, although owners reported no negative effects on behaviour, they were only asked about problem behaviours like aggression, not about anxiety and stress. Um, and of course, like all questionnaires, it relied on the accounts of a non-professional. Uh, the second study we'll look at also concluded that e-collars were effective. The collars were activated every time the dog barked, and the researchers found that by the second day of wearing an e-collar, the dogs barked less than a control group of dogs who hadn't been wearing the e-collar. And that by the third day of wearing the collars, no more electric impulses were given, they weren't required. However, on day three, there was no difference in the amount that the control dogs barked compared to the dogs wearing the e-collars, which the authors suggest was due to large variation in the amount that the control dogs barked, but could suggest that the e-collars either weren't effective or needed more time to work consistently. The other thing this study looked at was plasma cortisol level. Now cortisol is a hormone that dogs produce in response to stress. Cortisol increased by 0.7 in the control group compared to 8 in the e-collar group, but these differences weren't considered significant by the authors. So overall, this study found e-collars may reduce barking, but we can't be sure because the authors didn't consider natural differences in the barking level between the two groups. The next study we're going to look at 
was a lab study that used 14 laboratory beagles and they looked at the welfare impact of e-collars by measuring heart rate and cortisol again. And they trained the dogs for one and a half hours a day using one of three methods. First was aversion, where the dogs re received an electric impulse if they touched a rabbit dummy. The second was hear, where the dogs received shock if they didn't obey a previously trained hear command while chasing the rabbit dummy or random, where the dogs received the electrical impulses haphazardly to stimulate the use by a non-professional. Uh, for three months prior to the study, the dogs were taken to the training area to become familiar with it. Um, for the first five days of the actual training, the dogs were allowed to chase the rabbit dummy, and then a control was carried out to ensure that any changes the researchers found in heart rate or cortisol was not simply caused by sudden frustration at not being able to chase that rabbit dummy. So for these days, the dogs were held on a lead while the toy was moved around. And this was then followed by seven days of training with the e-collar using one of the three methods. And then four weeks later, the dogs were brought back to the training area to see how they reacted to it. So the researchers found that the dogs who received electric impulses for touching the rabbit dummy showed only a slight rise in cortisol during training, whereas the dogs in the group shocked for not obeying a recall command and those shocked haphazardly showed significant increases above that caused by restraint on a lead. Now, these dif this difference is most likely caused by the dog's inability to predict and therefore avoid the impulses. So in the aversion group, the dog knew it could avoid the impulse by avoiding the rabbit dummy. But in the recall group, they had slightly less control as they couldn't predict when they would be called and, as a more complex behaviour, it would have taken them longer to understand how to avoid the impulse. And in the final group, of course, they had no way of understanding what was causing the impulse and so no way of controlling it. And interestingly, the result for all groups was a complete disinterest in chasing the rabbit following training. And all the dogs had increased cortisol when brought back to the training area four weeks later, even though no e-collars were put on them. And this suggests that the recall dogs may not have linked the impulse to a punishment for not responding to the hear command, but rather to the rabbit showing how dogs may link the electric impulses to, and therefore become fearful of, things around them and the area itself where they are e-collar trained. Finally, in terms of response to the electrical impulses, the heart rate of the dog peaked, was at its highest point following activation of the e-collar, suggesting the impulses were painful and or frightening. Um, so the next study we're going to look at involved 32 German Shepherds, which were being trained as guard dogs, and looked at the dog's direct reaction to the administration of an electrical impulse, and then their behaviour while they were being trained, and then later on while they were on a walk with their owner. The dog's immediate response to the impulses were yelps, avoidance, and in some cases even snapping at the owner. Um, two groups of dogs were compared, those who had received e-collar training and those who hadn't, but both groups were trained using physical punishment. The dogs in the first group showed much more stress-related behaviours while being trained and went on a walk with their owner. And the authors concluded this suggested the impulses were painful, made training stressful for the dogs, and caused them to be fearful around their owner, even outside of training. So if we look at the results, control here refers to the group of dogs who weren't trained using an e-collar, and shocked is the dogs that were trained using an e-collar. Now, the y-axis shows the number of times per observation the dogs showed the behaviour and is an average across all the dogs in the group. So the dogs that were trained using e-collars were much more likely to be showing this tongue-flicking behaviour, which is a sign of anxiety, than dogs trained using without an e-collar. And if we look at another behavioural indicator of anxiety, which is to lift the front paws out of context, Again, we find that dogs trained using e-collars showed more of this anxiety than dogs trained without them. And these same differences were seen when the dog was on a walk with the owner, so when no training was going on and when the e-collar wasn't being worn. And some other interesting observations the researchers made was that some dogs would jump and yelp even when they hadn't received an impulse. And one dog in particular was given the command heel and then immediately received that impulse, and after that he yelped whenever he heard the heel command. 
But all of the studies we've looked at so far can be criticised because they only looked at training with an e-collar. They didn't compare this with alternative methods. So let's have a look at a few studies that did. So the next study used 63 pet dogs who had been referred to a veterinary clinic with recall problems and split them into three groups. So these were trained by a trainer using an e-collar, trained by a trainer not using an e-collar, and trained by a qualified behaviourist not using an e-collar. And in addition, three dogs were trained using e-collars by non-professionals. Each dog received two 15-minute training sessions per day for five days, and these sessions were recorded to assess differences in behaviour, and they also looked at differences in cortisol level. Now, they found no difference in owner-reported improvement between the three groups. So the owners of all the groups said that they were similarly happy with the training that had been carried out and the response of their dogs. And this showed that the use of the e-collars provided no benefit and reward-based training was just, a, just as effective even over a short time period. What did differ between the groups was the stress response. On application of the electric impulse, the majority of dogs either yelped or cried and then spent 40% more of their time tense after they had been shocked and showed more stress-related behaviours like that lip licking. Also, the dogs in the e-collar group spent more time moving away from and avoiding the trainer than the dogs in the reward group. And if we look at cortisol, which is the stress hormone that dogs release, um, here you can see sample zero shows the cortisol levels in the dogs when they arrived at the centre. Sample one was taken from dogs following training without an e-collar. Sample two was taken from dogs trained with an e-collar. And as you can see, this is much higher. And finally, sample three was taken from dogs trained using the e-collar 40 minutes after training. And as you can see, levels had still not returned to pre-training. The group trained using e-collars by non-trainers had even higher levels of behavioural indicators of stress and cortisol. And interesting, the main difference between trainer and amateur use was that amateurs tended to select the highest level and give no warning, whereas trainers would select the lowest level the dogs reacted to and then give the dogs a warning beep before they were shocked, so they had a chance to change their behaviour to control whether the shock occurred or not. Now, one major criticism of this study is that it only ran for five days, which meant that differences between the trainers in terms of training success couldn't be fairly determined. The next study that compared e collie use to other techniques used questionnaires. So owners were asked what training methods they had used and why they had used them and if they had worked. And most people who replied who had used e collars had used them for e call or ch recall <laughs> or chase problems. So that's what the researchers compared. So here are the results. So reward here refers to positive reinforcement, which is giving the dog something it likes, and negative punishment, which means to withhold something the dog likes. Other aversive refers to negative reinforcement, where you reward the dog for something by taking away something it doesn't like, such as putting a painful pressure on them and then stopping when they do what you want, and positive punishment, which is to give something unpleasant, like a smack. Uh, but this in excluded electrical stimulus because obviously that was analysed separately. So this graph shows the percentage of owners which reported the training had worked and as you can see e-collars were the least effective, even less so than other aversive techniques, techniques, whereas the use of reward was the most effective. So to finish off, we'll have a look at a study that aimed to evaluate if the use of electrical impulses on dogs could lead to aggressive behaviour. Now the theory goes that the dog will feel the pain of the impulse and respond defensively in an attempt to get away from the stimulus or to stop it happening. Basically the dog could think that the person nearest to them was the cause of the impulse and attack them either in an attempt to escape or defend themselves. So this is actually comprised of five case studies. Um, the evidence from which was taken from legal notes when the dogs had attacked someone following receiving an impulse from a pet fence system where the e-collar activates if the dog attempts to cross a boundary wire. So the first case was a two-year-old golden retriever who had worn the pet fence e-collar for a while. Um, a friend of the owner arrived and called the dog to him over the boundary and upon crossing it and receiving a shock, the dog attacked the friend for approximately 30 seconds before stopping and returning to his normal friendly self. 
The next case was another golden retriever, and the incident occurs the first time the dog wore the e-collar. The owner led the dog into the boundary area on a lead, as per, per the pet fence manufacturer's instructions, to experience the impulse so that he would avoid the area in future. However, when the collar activated, the dog responded immediately by attacking his owner. The third case occurred when a dog approached the boundary and his owner followed him to pull him back. As the dog received the electric impulse, he jumped and then attacked the owner, but as soon as he was removed from the boundary, he stopped biting. The next case was a Japanese Akita called Obi, who had worn the collar for a while and escaped a few times, so was being retrained at a higher impulse level. The attack occurred when a boy came and stood just outside the boundary, and Obi approached the boy to trot in a friendly manner with no barking or growling. Once he crossed the boundary line and the collar activated, Obi viciously attacked the boy, but like in the other cases, once he was removed from the boundary by the owner, he returned to a non-aggressive state. And the final case was a Rottweiler called Rocky, who again had worn the collar for a while, and aside from a few instances, it had contained him effectively. Rocky was walking near the boundary when he came across a, a group of boys playing just on the other side of it. He lay down quietly inside of the boundary, and because he seemed friendly, the boys came into his boundary and uh, started to stroke him. And Rocky uh, greeted the boys enthusiastically and knocked one of the boys over in his enthusiasm, started licking his face. Um, but when the boys left, Rocky followed them across the boundary, and he then nipped a boy and repeatedly bit another. Now, the thing to remember is that none of these dogs had ever showed aggression before and none of them had showed any warning signs prior to the attack which strongly suggests the attack was triggered by the electric impulse. An aggressive behaviour in response to electric impulses has also been documented in lots of different species and on lab beagles. Um, though it must be noted that this was based on non-professional observations of behaviour. Uh, one more interesting finding was that two of the owners, the, the Japanese Akita and the Rottweiler, had previously gone over the boundary despite the electric impulse, suggesting that certain breeds are not sensitive enough for the impulses to be effective as a deterrent. So, to recap, some studies suggest that e-collars are effective and don't cause behavioural problems or welfare issues. However, the majority of studies suggest that the use of e-collars is stressful for dogs, even above that caused by other punishments, and can lead to the dog fearing the trainer and the area in which they are being trained. Furthermore, comparisons with other methods suggest that reward-based training is just as, if not more effective than e-collar training. And there is also a clear effect of how the collar is used, such as a reduced stress response with a professional use and a warning beep followed by sufficient time to be able to avoid the impulse if they modify their behaviour. Finally, the use of e-collar could cause fear and aggression related behavioural problems as dogs often link the impulse with something other than what the trainer intended. And it can also put anyone at risk nearby of attack as the dog mistakenly thinks that they are the cause of the pain and react defensively. So, what do you think about electronic training collars? What conclusions would you draw from this evidence?